Tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. A seed planted today takes root and grows into a tree that bears fruit in the future. Over 110 years ago, a seed was planted. Today, that seed, the idea of excellence, has grown into the University of Pretoria, South Africa's largest contact research-intensive university. Nine faculties and a business school are spread across seven beautiful campuses, which are home to over 50,000 students, ready to make an impact in the world beyond university and join our global network of nearly 300,000 alumni. Future-focused, sustainably developed facilities and cutting-edge multi- and transdisciplinary research are underpinned by a desire to transform lives and have a positive impact on communities and the world. Excellence in teaching, learning, research innovation, arts and culture, and sports puts us firmly amongst the world's best universities. Knowledge is not just what is in books, it is the wisdom to apply it, to nourish and nurture the seed so that it takes root, grows tall, bears fruit and branches out. UP plants that seed, that tiny bit of curiosity, creativity, critical thinking, hope, the desire to care, respect, help and innovate against all odds, to grow, to leave your mark, to excel, to challenge the norm, to think, to rethink, to discover, to inquire, to lead, to have courage, to make a difference and to persevere. This is the University of Pretoria. We make today and every day matter. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening to our virtual world. Good morning and good afternoon to our panelists. Welcome to this event, which is entitled The Women's Role in the Transformation of Africa. That is one of the events we organize at University of Pretoria. During this month, dedicated to women, particularly in Africa. And today, we are very pleased to convene this session to discuss the role and the place of African women uh, on the social, economic, and cultural transformation of Africa. And we will discuss during this session important issues such as the academic, scientific, technological development of Africa. As you all know, um, the economies in Africa have been engaged um, in you know, growth for many decades. Now, during this COVID-19, we have been under a serious anthropose, the pose of humanity. And the big question we are asking is how to reconcile this momentum of growth, this momentum of acceleration and transformation using the total set of brain and creativity we have in Africa. We can't do that without engaging the large deal of the knowledge and skills we have through women power and women leadership. So we cannot achieve and control sustainable development without many aspects related to women, without gender equality. I'm sure our panelists will talk about it very soon. In particular for education and employment, um, we will also be very interested in this session, actually, to discuss how to restructure society, how to respond to the new conditions of living after COVID, the aspirations of growth, and the aspirations of education and health for, for children. Sustainability challenge is at the crossroad, and it becomes a very salient issue that is important to address when we talk about women empowerment and women leadership. So the support of women um, through their leadership is one aspect through which we can count to support Africa development. 
And this event is hosted, as you all know, from the flyer in the Future Africa Center. The Future Africa Institute has been created in 2019. It's a very recent center. It is born through an ambition, the ambition of our leaders. And you will hear soon uh, from our vice chancellor who had this vision that science is only relevant in Africa if that science is Pan-African. Pan-African science relevance is absolutely crucial to the critical mass building to respond to the structural deficit of scientists, researchers, and leaders uh, to create transformation. We can't have Africa's transformation without creating a place where transdisciplinarity is the main pace through which we harness science and we create solutions for Africa. And that's one of the big reasons why Future Africa has been created. It will support in our mission, we will support the policy environment, the development of evidence um, for the advancement of Africa, the process of implementing research action. Uh, you know, you're talking about having research that matters to people, that has impact to society, and create capacity development outcomes uh, to reduce academic distance and to improve the profile of knowledge in Africa. Today, we are lucky. We are lucky in several ways. We are lucky to have the last day of the Women's Month. This is 31st of August, and that's the very last day. So we get profit and we take credit from everything that has been done through the month that we can wrap up in our session today. Secondly, we are very lucky to have a very high level expert in the lineup of the panels. I will let the moderator to present them very soon. But more importantly also, we are very lucky to have our vice chancellor and principal, Professor Tawana Kupe, who will address the uh, virtual world, all the audience, before we start the panel discussion. So I would like to welcome Prof. Tawana Kupe, vice chancellor and principal of University of Pretoria to present his statement. Prof. Kupe, we are honored to have you here with us and the floor is yours for your statement. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sheikh Mbao, Director of the Future Africa Institute and Campus. And a very good evening to everybody who is attending this uh, webinar on a very important topic. As, we, as uh, Prof Mbao said, the Future Africa Institute and Campus is dedicating to making a difference, to solving some of the most complex, complicated and intersectional issues that face the continent and indeed the world. Gender equality, equity, and empowerment is one of those. I might go as far as say that without addressing gender equity, equality, and empowerment, Africa's complex, wicked, complicated, and intersectional issues will not be resolved. In other words, will not be able to, to achieve genuine democracy and inclusive, sustainable development that makes our continent prosper. Although women's access to political participation, governance, and higher education across Africa has been improving, the number of women in positions of leadership remains low compared to the number of men. To bring this into perspective, only 30% of seats in national parliaments of 46 African countries are held by women. 5% of CEOs of major companies in Africa are women and women make up 3% of the vice chancellors that head African universities. That's 40 out of 1,500 universities across Africa. Our university had a previous female vice chancellor and our chair of council, uh, Ms. Futim Toba, who's in this audience today, is a woman and our council is fairly, is a significant representation of women. But this is not enough. The norm is the low percentages that I've just read out. Here in South Africa, this is no different. Only 15% of South African universities are vice, vice chancellors are women. Based on the current composition of the National Assembly, the proportion of women is 46%. This shows that the participation of women in positions of leadership in politics and higher education in South Africa remains low, given that women make up 51% of the population. These statistics, related to some of the highest social positions, paint a very bleak feature. 
deep picture. But that one can be challenged and changed. And that is our mission. Universities have the capacity to advance and redress social e e equity for women towards restructuring and reconfiguration of leadership in political, economic, and education institutions in Africa. The representation of men and women at all levels of leadership for an organization is only one indicator organizes that organizations are gendered. Institutions such as universities need to proactively promote and enable the advancement of women to all levels of leadership and academic rank. Let me say that it is not enough for you for institutions of higher learning to say they are against they are they they, they are not they are not for patriarchy or for men to say they are not sexist. What is required is to be actively anti patriarchal, actively anti sexist, and actively pro uh, change in inequality and equity. Policies within social institutions need to be intentional about eliminating gender distinction and mainstream gender equality into the regular rules, procedures, and practices of institutions. As you know, it is the institutional culture that matters, but culture is everyday life. If those things do not turn at that level, you will not also get the structural changes that you need. Mentorship and sharing of experiences is one key aspect that will help to increase women's representation and their participation in leadership roles in, in Africa's higher education sector, political institutions, the economy, social and cultural organizations, and in governance in general. As catalysts for political, economic, sociological, social and technological and generators of knowledge, institutions of higher education are spaces where women in top leadership positions can inspire and mentor young people, in particular young women to aspire for the top positions and to make a difference. Not only that, in transformation of the curriculum and reforms of institutions, higher education needs to integrate the values of diversity, equity, equality, and inclusion. These reforms must have components of restorative justice into institutional governance, management, policy, and strategy development. As African women quickly reflect on the progress that has been made in increasing women's position in politics, governance, and advancing gender equality in higher education, patriarchal attitudes, structures, and positions that represent women as less capable leaders need to be challenged and changed. We need to keep not only discussions going, but also make sure that urgent action is taken to promote gender inclusiveness. It is encouraging to see the diverse range of women that this discussion has brought together to have this conversation and this discourse. It is evidence that the ways are slowly changing and women themselves are taking up spaces to talk about what needs to be done and are driving the change. But let not it be a long walk to gender equity and equality. We, it is within our means to make it as short as possible. In that regard, men need to reflect on their privilege and their power and to democratize it to enable equality. I congratulate Future Africa for opening up the space for this conversation. As the university, we will continue to support all efforts towards advancing women. Because as we all know, women's rights are women's rights. If, we re if half the population remains subjugated to particular structures, practices, and economies, the entirety of humanity will not develop. I thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Kupe. I think this important statement um, will set the scene for a very vivid discussion. There is very important point you raise indeed is the deficit of women in leadership program and the important of the importance of universities to address that structural deficit of women leadership and university of True pretoria is doing a great effort under your leadership to make this happen so we are very pleased to have this discussion very aligned with your statement i would like at this point uh, after this important statement from our vc to welcome 
Mrs. Nozifo Chabalala, who will be the moderator of the session to take you through the different panelists' bios and, and start the discussion with the audience. Mrs. Nozifo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mbao, and a big thank you, of course, to our Vice Chancellor and Principal. I'm going to kick us off with a special high level statement that has been prepared for us by the United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Women, that is Dr. Pumzile Mlambo Mbuka. Now, for all of us, we know that. Uh, wherever you are in the world, that she comes into these spaces with a wealth of experience and a wealth of expertise on issues um, maintaining to human rights, equality, and social justice. Here in South Africa and on the continent broadly, we also recognize her leadership uh, for having served as a deputy president of South Africa from 2005 to 2008. And of course, in this moment, it matters uh, that she was the first woman to serve in that capacity. And in her role, we saw her overseeing programs to combat poverty and to bring the advantage of a growing economy to the poor with a particular focus on women. One of the things I remember her clearly always articulating in her time was that if it works for women, it will work for the world. She's been a longtime champion of women's rights and she is affiliated with a range of organizations that are devoted to education, women's empowerment and gender equality. Ladies and gentlemen, please, this short high level statement from Dr. Pumzile Mlamunguka. Happy Women's Day, South Africa, and Happy Women's Month. Indeed, we say Happy Women's Month, even though this is a time of challenges and difficulties, because we do aspire for all women and girls to have a Happy Women's Month and to have a happy life every day, wherever they are. It is a time to both protest as well as to celebrate what we have achieved. This year, we also mark the 25 years since the most comprehensive agreement of nations about gender equality in Beijing. That work has not been completed. And that is why we have generation equality to take this work forward between 2020 and 2025. And we thank South Africa for being part of this effort and for focusing especially on fighting for economic justice, as well as fighting to end men's violence against women. This is 2020 a year of challenges. COVID-19 has meant that about two thirds of the people who have lost their jobs at this time are women. So women's poverty is a reality because women work in the informal sector. Women have no savings in general, no insurance, and they do not generally have enforceable contracts, especially in the service sector, in the hospitality and in the tourism sector, where jobs have been lost in large amounts. We are therefore asking for the fiscal stimulus that is being provided by government to please pay attention in a granular way to how this will also benefit women. We urge activists, business organizations, uh, women who are accountants, AUKA, to make sure that these fiscal stimulus respond to women's needs. We have violence against women that have spiked and we have called for the needs that women have at this time when they are affected by violence to be declared essential services 
so that they are accessible to women anytime as women need them, be they shelters, hotlines, but we also want to strengthen the implementation of the good laws we already have in South Africa. We also want to echo the words of President Ramaphosa to call all the men of South Africa to stand up and not be bystanders and fight to end this violence against women. We appreciate the role that the churches are playing. We applaud also the men that are coming forward to provide leadership by mobilizing other men. We applaud a uh, Make, we applaud uh, John Carney, we applaud Sia Kolisi, who has also been announced as the UN uh, champion on ending violence against women. We applaud young psychologists who are trying to understand this. We applaud Sonke Gender Justice for the work it does but we need much more than this. It is not enough. During COVID, we've also seen the importance of digital infrastructure. The need to make sure that all communities have access to digital services, and we also have to close the digital gender gap. We also have to make sure that all girls go back to school when schools reopen for everybody. We must not lose the girls along the way. We worked so hard for girls' education. We must not let COVID-19 lose this momentum that we have gained. Same thing on maternal health. We have to protect the gains that we have made in maternal health and we still have much more to do. We appreciate all South Africans who are taking the right steps to end the pandemic and we urge those who have not been able to do as much as they need to do, to do their part. And we also ask for the end of corruption because women lose a lot when public resources are being siphoned and stolen. I thank you for listening to me and I hope that we see this as a new beginning. We cannot go back to the world before COVID. We have to create a new world for ourselves. We get one chance to do this as this generation. Thank you. A beautiful message there and a call to action, a challenge, if you will, that as we look at the fiscal uh, packages that are coming back into the economy to restart, rebuild, re-jump economies, that these are interrogated. And we need to be asking the question, where are the women? I also heard a call for men to not just as, uh, be bystanders, but for men to stand up and be part of the solution. And of course, the final thing here is that as we see this explicit transition into a digital world with built on digital economies, that this is not done with women being left behind. A very big thank you to Dr. Pumzilem Lambunguka for her high level statement. I do want to acknowledge the global reach of this conversation. I've seen quite a number of your comments coming through saying hi from South Africa, from Brazil, from India, from Tanzania, from Kenya and many more other countries. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. And of course, uh, we're keen to hear where everybody else is logging in from. Before I uh, introduce uh, my panelists and lead them into the conversation, I want to pause for a second and I want to invite you into the conversation. We want you to be a part of this conversation and to claim your share of voice. And the way that you can do that is by sending us your questions on, and your comments um, using the Slido app. So you see the details at the bottom of your screen now. It's slido.com. You will be asked for an event code or a password and it's hashtag Future Africa. Please follow Zinzile's lead. Zinzile's already sent us a question that is 
on point, but I'm certainly going to be pulling into the conversation. I also want to just remind you that we are amplifying this conversation on social media and we're letting the world know what we are talking about on this last day of Women's Month in South Africa. The hashtags that we're using is hashtag UP women, hashtag women transforming Africa, and hashtag leading women. Let's amplify what we're going to hear um, through the social media channels that are available to us using those hashtags. Mark, we see you and hello to you from Joburg. With that, I would like to also uh, bring to your attention that we're going to be participating in some polls, um, and those polls um, are going to give us a real sense of what you think of some of the big issues that we're going to be discussing. But allow me to introduce my panelists now. As Prof Mbao and Prof Kupe uh, indicated, we have a stellar panel. I'd like to start off by introducing Dr. Joani Bewa. She is a multi-award winning physician from Benin Republic, and she's really passionate about sexual and reproductive health through training, advocacy, and research. She's a public health research associate at the University of South Florida College of Public Health. In 2020, earlier this year in June, she was appointed as Woman in Global Health Interim Board Chair. Um, and this to support gender equality in global health leadership. She's probably known to many of us as an advocate for the SDGs. Dr. Bell, I ask you to mute your microphone for me, if you will, so as to minimize the echo. Thank you very much. And she's also chair of the Young Women Caucus of the Continental African Women Leaders Network. She's going to tell us a little bit more about the network and what the network does. Dr. Bell, thank you very much for being with us um, this evening, this afternoon, this morning, depending on where you're joining us from around the world. I'd like to introduce now Ms. Rumbizai Chisenga. She is the Director of Leadership Programs at the Ellen Johnson Sirleaf Presidential Center for Women and Development. And she leads the Amujai Initiative. This is the center's flagship program that prepares women, and listen to this, to unapologetically take up roles in the highest echelons of public leadership. She is She's completed a leadership development residency at Columbia University in New York as an Obama scholar. And prior to all of this, she was program manager at the Mandela Institute for Development Studies. Rumbizai, it's such a pleasure and an honor to have you with us uh, this uh, today. Let me put it today. And with that, I'd like to introduce Prof. Leslie Patrick. Prof is uh, in the Department of Chemistry. She's a professor in the Department of Chemistry at uh, the University of the Western Cape, or UWC. Uh, she's also group leader of the Environmental and Nanoscience Group. Uh, she is a well-known, well-established expert in the field of environmental mediation, water treatment, and beneficiation of industrial waste. Uh, Prof Patrick has is the recipient of many, many prestigious, prestigious awards for her contribution to science, to engineering, to technology and research capacity development on the continent. I could read the CV for an entire hour. I'm literally just picking at the top of everybody's bio. Last but certainly not least in this conversation, what an honor for me to introduce Dr. Tamala Tonga Kambi Kambi. Uh, she is the Deputy Vice Chancellor at the University of Zambia. And she was appointed as Deputy Vice Chancellor at Cavendish Uni uh, University, Zambia, between uh, uh, 2018 and the 1st uh, of February in 2020, before she was she moved to her current role. She served in a number of capacities as the chairperson of the National Governing Council of the African Peer Review Mechanism. She's also served as chairperson and board member on the Zambia Daily Mail, and as well as chairperson of the audit committee on the board of the Zambia Development Agency. Now, ladies and gentlemen, irrespective of where you're joining us from around the world, I think you will agree with me that we are in for some wisdom, some richness, and some insight, and this panel is absolutely fantastic. But before I get to the panel, I want to get to you first. I'm going to launch a poll, and I'm going to ask that the technical team launch our first poll for us, and it literally links to the Beijing uh, conference in 1995 that Dr. Pumzile Mlambunguka also referred to. And here's the question that I'd like you just to reflect on. 
At the Fourth World Conference of Women in Beijing in 1995, governments reaffirmed their commitment to advance the goals of equality, of development, and peace for all women everywhere. Here's the question. Do you think we are any closer to reaching those goals that were set in Beijing? Choose A if you think yes, there are some gains being made, but we still have a lot of work to do. B, if you say no, in fact, girls and women's rights and gender equality are still not recognized as they should. And C, if you feel that you absolutely don't know and don't have a sense of whether we're moving forward, whether we're moving backwards, or whether we're standing stock still. I'm going to come back to you with the results of that poll. I'm going to close the poll now and hope that you have participated. Let's go to Dr. Bewa. I want to kick off with you, Dr. Bewa. And as we think about the, uh, the conference title for us today, Women's Role in the Transformation of Africa, why do you then focus on sexual and reproductive health? What is the link between sexual and reproductive health and ensuring that women are playing a prominent role in the transformation of the continent? Thank you for the question. Uh, it's a privilege to be here and attend this panel. You know, my research and teaching focused are in sexual reproductive health, women's health and maternal health, while my advocacy work focused a little bit more on gender equality and health. As you know, investing in reproductive health is, a crit is critical because first, maternal and child health and reproductive health represent major health crisis in sub-Saharan Africa. Women and girls are still dying from unplanned pregnancy, from complication of pregnancy, and adolescents among 10, 24 are the one paying the highest price. And due to this, women and girls are more vulnerable and at risk of both communicable and non-communicable diseases, which will result in you know, unsafe abortion, but also prevent those girls and women from fulfilling their full potential. And when I talk about potential, I, I want to do a quick transition about the work that we are doing at, at, with the African Women Leaders Network, which is a joint network between uh, the African Union and the United Nations convened by the African Union Special Advisor on Women, Peace and Security, Madam Bineta Diop, and Madam Fonzile, Dr. Fonzile Mblawanguka, UN Women Executive Director, having our patron as a President Ellen Johnson Soli. So the role of this network is really to support advancing African women leadership through flagship programs, peer learning, experience, as well as cross-generational dialogue from governance, peace and security, finance, youth, agriculture and social mobilization. And please let me allow me to, to, to share with you that since the network has been established in June 2017, the network achievement range from multiplying and amplifying the voices of African women leaders on the ground to enhancing their representation, participation, and leadership in key decision-making processes. Dr. Bell, I think that's an incredible contribution because on the one hand, you have uh, shared with us the work that you focus on around sexual reproduction and health and such a clear linkage into when women have agency and decision making uh, power in that space, how we see that translating into representation and leadership. But you also mentioned the, your patron um, as uh, uh, President Ellen Johnson Sully. So I'm compelled to go to Rumbizai uh, for the next question. And so Rumbizai, the question I bring to you is, why focus on leadership, especially, I mean, I know you're quite passionate and the EGA Center is passionate about women in the driving seat of economic development and women in the driving seat of inclusive growth across the continent. Why do we need women to be in leadership? in order to achieve that. Thank you, Rosie. Uh, it's my pleasure to participate in this discussion. Um, you know, leaders are central to driving change. Uh, they are visionaries. They help us to reimagine society. They are strategic mobilizers. They help us to gather the resources and momentum to get moving. And perhaps more importantly, leaders are the, the models, the custodians of uh, entrenched norms. Uh, so they model the behavior and the standards for us and they help to establish them and sustain them. Uh, and so if we're thinking about an inclusive society, economic development, challenging all the entrenched injustice, the injustices and in inequalities, we need to be thinking about harnessing 
half of our society and getting them to share their ability to innovate, their ability to, to reimagine the society, their ability to mobilize and gather resources, and their ability to be custodians of a new society. And so uh, when we talk about women uh, seeking their place in society, it really is about wanting to contribute to shaping the society that we all inhabit uh, and to also get an opportunity to express the talents, the gifts, the richness that comes with half of the population of our continent. I think it's a fantastic answer. Reimagining, innovating, and stepping up as custodians of this emerging society that we say we want. And it's just absolutely incredulous that 51% uh, of, of the world's population has, to a large extent, been left on the periphery and on the sidelines of reimagining their own societies, innovating around their own societies, and stepping up as, as, as custodians. Now, before I move on to Prof. Um, uh, Patrick, there's a quick question here from Zinzi Lelutuli, and I'm I'm going to bring it to you, Rumbizai, because we're talking about leadership here. And Zinzel is saying, how do we invite corporate South Africa to this conversation? Women leaders are often used as tokens in the current reality. So she's pushing back and she's saying, yes, we get this idea that we buy into uh, women as, as leaders. But if you look at what corporate is doing, are women really leaders in that space? And how do we get corporate into the conversation? It's a very good question. And I, I thought we were going to warm up to this question, but <laughs> Zinzile is, is awake. Um, I honestly think that it's time we changed our accountability structures. So uh, I think this conversation about women has been going round and round in circles and mostly paper is exchanged in the form of accountability. We require our uh, institutions to submit some written documentation to fulfill some requirement that is also just a paper tick box. Nobody really ever pays attention. Um, I think it's time that we, maybe for next year's dialogue, we get some CEOs from South African companies. Let's have names and faces to these leaders and the reasons why there is progress or lack of progress. But perhaps we should stop just writing notes to each other and filing them and then moving on. Um, I actually think that one way of getting corporate South Africa to be more accountable is if we have names and faces. Imagine if a financial uh, report was accompanied by a diversity report, but not just in writing. Uh, imagine if we, when we're announcing our financial report, when we have that big banner behind the CEO and flashes, camera lights, what if we accompanied that report with some statistics about the number of women who are occupying key positions in that organization, the efforts that have been taken to groom more women leaders in that organization, and the efforts that are being made to impact the society in which the, 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 the industry or sector in which that company operates to raise more women and girls to be interested in the kind of work or the nature of work that they're doing. Sure, Rumbiza, you've said so much in that, and I just want to maybe underscore what you've said by saying this. If you look at the top 40 companies listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange today, the top 40, not a single one of those companies has a woman as a CEO. And so to your point, we need to, we need to hold corporates accountable. But I always believe that we measure and we incentivize and we celebrate that which we value. And so the question to corporate then becomes, why are we not putting measurements around the inclusion of women and incentivizing the inclusion of women? So just a thought. Um, Katlefa, I see your question. I think it's best for Dr. Kambi Kambi to answer. So I'll get to Dr. Kambi Kambi in a moment. But to Prof. Patrick first. Prof, you are one of the foremost leaders in terms of women in the STEM area. Um, on the continent, around the world. In your view, Prof, why is it important to have women in leadership um, in, in the STEM field? Um, and how does that contribute to, to economic growth on, on the continent? And how does it contribute to inclusive growth in Africa? You're muted, Prof, can we unmute you? 
my apologies. That's a very important uh, point about uh, reaching parity for women. I think uh, STEM, uh, the sciences, are where a lot of uh, progress still needs to be made in terms of drawing women into a sphere of activity where they've uh, traditionally avoided going because it seems daunting. It, it, it's kind of scary to step in there. And the typical reaction I get when I tell people what I'm doing, they say, oh, that's very nice. What's the weather like today? <laughs> and the topic gets changed. People immediately assume that they're not going to be able to understand what you're saying. And I think that's a self-esteem issue. And I think uh, women need to also understand that they've got a great deal of uh, proactive work to do, not to stand back all the time and to actually insist in their spheres as far as possible for, for instance, sharing of family responsibilities and cutting against patriarchal attitudes, speaking up when somebody puts you down, um, making a fuss when there's a glass ceiling and calling people out when they uh, put you into a stereotypical role or treat you in a stereotypical way. And I think we also need to be more demanding about our remuneration because uh, remuneration is often an area where we lag because we don't actually insist that we get treated fairly. And, you know, when we're sitting in a male-dominated selection panel or an environment where promotion is, is decided by predominantly male uh, panels, it can be quite intimidating to go and face those people. But, you know, I really feel very hopeful. I think we've made a lot of progress in the STEM area. You know, just for instance, when I started going to conferences, I would be the only lady there, whereas now we've got plenty, plenty young ladies, young women in the audience and participating as speakers. So I think we are slowly but surely breaking that bias. Prof. Patrick, thank you uh, very much. And I just want to underscore some of the very um, uh, doing words, I think they're called verbs in English, that you have, um, you've underscored for us. You've said, uh, we, we, we need to um, be proactive, we need to call it out, we need to demand. Um, and, and, and what I'm hearing from that is that we need to exercise our agency as well, as while we're fixing corporate culture, while we're fixing policy, while we're fixing institutions, we also need to do the internal work that gives us the, the confidence to actually speak out when there are glass ceilings that need to be shattered. So thank you very much uh, for, that, uh, for that contribution. And, you know, uh, Prof. Patrick, before I move on, I just want to link what you've said back to some of the numbers that have come out of the poll. 69% of us said, yes, we're making progress, but not at the desired rate. 23% said, no, we're not making progress. And interestingly, when we do the quick maths, there's 8% that says, we actually don't know whether we're moving forward or moving back, which is, which is a big number. In, in light of the conversation that we're having. But Dr. Kambi Kambi, let me come to you. I was intrigued uh, when I heard um, the, our, our VC and principal saying only 3% uh, um, of women are vice chancellors in Africa today. And so perhaps the question to you is, what role do women in, lead, uh, women in leadership in academic institutions play in driving the transformation of the continent? Uh, thank you, Nozi, and um, hello to everyone from the heart of Africa in Lusaka, Zambia. Um, that question is uh, really important, and um, I think it's already been alluded to by uh, Leslie when she said there's a glass ceiling. I want to say that really in academia, it's beyond even that. It's a labyrinth where beyond the ceiling you're trying to just even find a way. Fortunately, there are some cracks, and that's the little percentage that you're seeing of those who've managed to squeeze through the cracks. And I believe that uh, the few of us who are there, we're not too comfortable because we need our sisters with us to feel more comfortable. However, we are there and we are helping in 
restructuring the factors that are the detriment to allowing others to come through. She mentioned, for example, that uh, in our days, you get into an interview panel, it's all male, eight of them, not even one female. So at least now we're seeing that when they come in and even the policies, we are having a say in those policies. So our presence, in my opinion, is giving a lot of young women that feeling that it is possible, that they can also do it. And I think that's one of the key things we're doing as role models, but also influencing the policies at this level. Dr. Kambi Kambi, I'm, I'm hearing you loud and clear. You're saying there aren't enough of us, but the ones that are there, we're pushing, we're working, we're restructuring, we're influencing, we're doing the little bit we, what, of what, what we can with what we have. Now, I want to bring uh, Katleko's question to you, Dr. Kambi Kambi, because I think it, it really relates to what you said. Katleko says, how can we as women position ourselves to have equity and not just equality in academic spaces? Thoughts, Dr. Kambi Kambi? Um, yes, uh, indeed, uh, equity is uh, what we should ensure. And again, it's nice to be amongst the last to say, uh, to have your say, because Leslie pointed out that we should speak out. Just because I'm a female deputy vice chancellor, I should not get less than what the male used to get before me. So there are all those issues where we are making sure that, uh, for example, at our own level, we are getting what we deserve, but we also translating that to every other person to be able to get what they deserve, not to be uh, shortchanged because of uh, their background. Love that. So what I'm hearing, Dr. Kambi Kambi, in a world designed by women, there would be more transparency, there would be more accountability. And so to back to Rumbizai's point, we need to create the opportunities for women to reimagine, re-engineer, redesign the society that we all deserve. So back to you, um, joining us from all over the world. Let's do a second poll. We've gotten a response from the first poll. So let's launch this question as we transition now from defining the challenge to beginning to think about the strategies and the interventions that we could bring to bear here's the question what interventions or strategies do you think would have the highest impact in advancing women is it a through the promotion of women's economic participation um, which requires action in a range of areas is it by primarily addressing the gender pay gap one of the ideas that Prof. Patrick raised for us. Is it about promoting the fulfillment of women's potential through education and skills development? Could it be that we need to increase political actions of women and their allies to change gender and other power hierarchies? Or could it be that perhaps the greatest impact is the ideal that women have a distinct moral obligation to have one another's backs? So you see women networks promoting, supporting, enabling each other. Or if, is the situation so dire that we actually have no idea what would move us forward to advance women? I look forward to seeing the outcome of that poll. But back to the conversation now. I want to take it back home, Dr. Bell. I want to take it back into the family. You know, as we, as we, one of the things that Dr. Mlambunguka said is that as schools reopen, we need to be mindful that young girls are also getting the opportunity to go back into the classroom. And the question for you that we have is that we often see that in poorer households that have to make the difficult decision of choosing between children and which child goes to school and which child stays at home, that it's often the girl child that has to sacrifice her education. How do we convince parents that all children are equal and need to be given an equal opportunity? 
Uh, I want to start um, by saying that, you know, none of us are equal until all of, all of us are equal. So if young girls and women are not seen as equal, none of us will be equal. So I think there is a need to have conversation, not just a family one-on-one -on -one conversation, but also public conversation where we can create space for girls and women friendly environment and participation. As we are also talking about education, you know that education is linked with economic empowerment and participation. There is one report that the World Economic Forum released last year, and in terms of economic participation, the gender gap will take 257 years to close. When we look at participation, look at Africa specifically, as of June 2020, only 12 countries have more than one third female ministers. And when we look at participation in terms of decision making in private sectors, only seven to 30% of the firms in 38 African countries have female top manager. So I think intervention should focus on not just education, participation, mentoring, but also strengthening women power. And one work that we are doing with the African Women Leaders Network, Young Women Caucus, is to develop and implement since last year, intergenerational dialogue frameworks and retreats, where we brought together the over 300 young women activists and scientists in business, in policy, with other senior leaders, head of state, to kind of develop a roadmap for intergenerational leadership, but also mentorship. Because we really believe that those can be critical tools to dismantle patriarchy, but also support and build a next generation of leaders. And we also think that intergenerational work or framework can really reinforce more intentionally, more inclusively, build transitional leadership for women, build innovative, sustainable ways of cross-generational mentorship. And even when we talk about equality and equity, I will even ask justice, because we need to dismantle the barrier that prevent us to reach equality and equity. And I will even ask power, because yes, equality, equity, justice, but we need to see women exercise the power. Dr. Bewa, thank you for that. And, and what I love about this part of the conversation is that we're filling the pot with tactics and strategies and tools and resources, and not just talking about the problem. And what I'm hearing you saying is, um, we need the clear strategies for intergenerational leadership and mentorship. We need to have structured conversations between women of different generations where we're passing on insights. And I'm also hearing you say we need to be very innovative around transitional leadership and how we make sure that those transitional bridges are strong and they are in place. I think those are some incredible, um, some incredible um, opportunities that you put on the table uh, here for us. And, and maybe, Rumbizai, if I come to you next with this idea of men standing up or men being bystanders, again, an idea that was raised by Dr. Mlambonguka. We know that real transformation of, of whether it's a, of an institution, of a country, or even as of an entire continent, as we're talking about tonight, um, it really doesn't happen unless everybody is rolled up their sleeves and is contributing. To what extent, though, are we seeing men stepping up, supporting, enabling, partnering with women um, to ensure that we, we are creating pathways and avenues for women to get to leadership? So uh, Dr. Mlambonuka, in her speech, uh, she actually acknowledged some men uh, by name and some organizations that are doing great work uh, to get men to step up to, and to be involved. Uh, but, you know, I, I could say that at a small scale, and this is probably at like nuclear family level, we've made some progress. Uh, we can certainly see that more girls are getting into school, uh, more girls are finishing school, more girls are getting an opportunity to be uh, at universities, in fact, there were some statistics that revealed that actually girls are enrolling in higher numbers uh, than men uh, in certain courses. And, and then we are seeing an opportunity being, opportunities opening up in places of employment as well. What we're not seeing is a coordinated and deliberate effort to dismantle patriarchy as a system. And so we're still operating by the rules of this, uh, this world that has been established. And we're trying to chip at the system 
uh, in small ways that we can, but actually we can we we can have the you know the 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 choice we do have the choice to make the decision that the system does no longer works for us and then we work towards establishing systems that are more inclusive that way we will see more and more people advancing more and more girls and women being empowered um and so this isn't work that only women can do uh it's work for all of us men need to be involved in this and I actually want to quote uh, uh, former President Obasanjo, who spoke at the launch of the Ellen Johnson Salif uh, Presidential Center in March. And he, his words to women uh, was that if you need to push, push. You can't sit and wait for these men to say, oh, the doors are open now. Here's equality. Uh, and I just want to reiterate that Prof. Patrick mentioned it in, in her uh, initial remarks as well that we can't sit back as women and wait for, for men to do this for us. But men must also hear us, uh, that we are not ignoring all the efforts that are being made. We're not ignoring the progress and the changes, but we need more. And we actually need to dismantle a system here. This is not small work. So let's not pat ourselves on the back for doing the things that we're supposed to do anyway. So, so Rumbita, I want to push back a little bit because I think I wholeheartedly buy into the narrative that you're sharing with us. But what incentive do men have to dismantle a system that serves them? The system that emerges will serve them better. I want to quote one article that uh, reported last week that um, if uh, we close the gender pay gap, we can increase the family income, which is supposed to be an obvious almost reference for, for those of us. You know, if you are earning more, then the family port is increasing. But this is just one example I want to highlight, that we're not getting any benefits by suppressing women. We could actually get more benefits, even if you were a man. You stand to gain better in a society that's more inclusive, that recognizes women. Uh, and for all those men who want to retire at 40, yeah. You could probably achieve your goal sooner if you were to advocate for your wife to earn what she deserves to earn. All That's right. just I'm going to pause, I'm, I'm pause it right there because I think it's a brilliant answer that uh, actually the emergent society um, that better serves all of humanity uh, would actually be would actually be a more desirable society than the one we have now. But Prof. Uh, Patrick, what Rumbizai has raised is is a sticky issue. You raised it. Um, at the beginning as well, this idea of the pay gap. And, and, and my, my question to you is, what strategies, interventions do you think are going to accelerate our journey and our progress to closing that pay gap? I mean, on the one hand, we talk about inclusive workspace, uh, workplaces, but it's inclusive workplaces don't automatically translate into fair and equal pay. How do we close that gap that not only is the workplace um, designed explicitly to be inclusive, but that women are being paid at the same and fair level for the same work that they're doing as their male counterparts. Well, I think that education is a very, very important part uh, of the whole strategy that one needs to um, follow. Because if your educational levels are equivalent to the male, then there's no reason why you should be paid less. And uh, certainly if your experience is uh, sound and relevant, then you should be able to stand your ground and argue for an uh, equivalent pay gap, but uh, for an equivalent pay. But I really think it's a case of we don't need to be strident. We just need to be firm and insist that our experience and our qualifications are equivalent. And, you know, I think uh, many women have uh, been put on the back foot because they maybe don't complete their education or they have got a lower education and therefore they have maybe more years of working experience, but they don't go back to study. Mm. And, you know, as a very late bloomer, I only got my PhD in my 50s because of family responsibilities and things like that. And, you know, I'm just saying life is, takes quite a while and you can go back and get your qualifications. And in your, when you're more mature, you can go and stand your ground a bit better than you could when you were a young woman. So mm -hmm. I think for us, 
we really need to step forward and and make our voices heard in a way that doesn't antagonize people, but that actually allows them to accept that this is a fair thing. Prof. Patrick, always uh, a really interesting contribution coming in there. And I think, you know, your ideas that you put on the table link us um, to this place of, you know, we talk about, you know, women challenging, um, whether it's in organizations or, at, or institutions, but perhaps the hardest place to challenge is at home and to challenge the cultural um, um, ways that we've been raised and socialized. And so, Dr. Kambi, Kambi, I want to come. I want to come to you in this because, you know, a lot of the gender imbalance actually comes from socialization. It comes from deep-rooted cultural practices and cultural lenses. How do we begin to challenge this? What strategies or interventions? will allow us beyond Rumbizai saying we need to dismantle patriarchy, but dismantle every element of culture that leaves women on the periphery and as secondary citizens and only followers that can never be leaders in their own homes, their own communities, and obviously makes the idea of leadership in institutions and organizations even more difficult. Um, thank you again, Nozi. Um, I think we have been we have been raised in such a manner that we feel as if there's something wrong with the woman and the woman needs to be fixed mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with the woman the woman is what she is and she's a full human being with all the rights and privileges that come with it what we need to fix are the systems the cultures of the organizations of the homes and these are things which have already been articulated but uh, just to reiterate for example my girl child if she's good at computers why am i forcing her to be playing with dolls and pots so those are small things but also when i come to the university i get these ambitious girls who say i want to do engineering i want to do this and somehow they come and say mm, but my family is telling me to go this way no go for it baby girl do it you can do it and let's as the mature women sit behind and you know urge them on and give them the support and keep on talking about these policies which should be dismantled. I want to just share quickly, for example, at my university, all the um, bursaries that come in, 30% are for women. The 70% that have remained, the women and the girls compete again on an even kill. So those are things that we're doing to make sure that these girls are able to come through. Dr. Kambi, Kambi, I love it's practical. It's a tool, it's a resource. We're putting it into the toolkit. I want to just reflect on a couple of comments that are coming through. Mark, um, I'm going to butcher your surname, Mark, but I think it's Vecharif, uh, says uh, we need holistic interventions that work in a range of sectors and spaces in a range of ways because there is no silver bullet in these interventions and responses. There's an anonymous question here that I'm not going to pose to anyone, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to just quickly use it as a way of the kind of mindset we need to be shifting. So the question from Anonymous is, how do we balance the variables that impact women in participation, such as flexible working hours in order to uh, maintain family life? Now, not for us to discuss because we're running out of time, but don't we wish that we're going to get to a world where we're having a conversation about how do we uh, balance the variables that impact men and women? Because men are actual active players in the household as well. And it is not the woman's responsibility only to make sure that homes run and households are being managed. And we begin to think about interventions that allow us to occupy those spaces um, together and equally. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that question there. I do want to send share back some of the poll results. So this is interesting. We asked questions around interventions and strategies, which is essentially what we've just spoken to. And here's the highest rate was saying we need to, at 17%, uh, 
We said we need to promote women's economic participation. Um, we need to um, increase political actions was also at 17%. However, the highest was we need to promote the fulfillment of women's potential through education and skills development at 58%. And wasn't it interesting that only 8% of our global audience uh, today believe that addressing the gender pay gap is one of the most ways that will have impact. The beautiful thing about these conversations is that it leads us to new questions that lead to breakthrough thinking and allow us to keep having this conversation so we can get to the core of what's really happening in our societies. I've got literally less than 10 minutes left. So I want to ask my panelists, um, before I ask my panelists, let me maybe launch my third poll, if I could please, uh, to the team. And let's, let's begin to look um, into the future. And here's the question, it's the final question for this uh, evening. What is the biggest challenge to women's advancement into positions of leadership? Is it, as per Rumbizai, patriarchal structures? Is it discrimin discriminatory institutions of power? Is it, um, as Dr. Kambi Kambi was helping us to decipher social and cultural norms? Or is it the queen bee belief the ideal that women just can't get along, that they undermine each other all the time. And E, is it, I don't know. Now I'm looking forward to seeing the results of this poll. But to my final question to my panelists, I want us to look into the future. We started off by scoping the challenge and trying to give meaning to the problems that women encounter. We then transitioned in the, to the conversation to begin to look at interventions and strategies that are going to allow us to really see women stepping up into the role of transforming the continent. I want us to think about now, as you sit in your respective spaces, what are the emerging issues that young women need to roll up their sleeves and get ready for? Because if, these, if young women are not taking up these issues as early as possible, we're going to have a different kind of wicked problem manifesting in their generation, if you will. And I'm literally going to, I'm looking at my clock, I'm literally going to give you 30 seconds to a minute each. What do you think young women should be getting ready to fight for and to dismantle and to make sure it doesn't manifest in the societies that we're trying to create? Dr. Bewa, to you first. So um, based on my own experience of over the past 10 years working in both clinical setting, philanthropy, governance, and now in science as a researcher, I think there are five quick points that I want to share. The first one, I think practicing being intentional and setting goals because it kind of sets you and puts you ahead. The second thing, I think it's really shaping the skills, as I think one of the panelists says, shaping your skills and making sure that you have the skills and the qualification so that you can have access to opportunities. Network and mentoring for me, it's critical and having an environment with allies and people to support your goals and your growth. The fourth point and that may be challenging is to learn how to brand yourself and bring some visibility about your work and your impact. And last but not the least, there to lead both professionally and in advocacy work. Take leadership roles and see a barriers as an opportunity. I, I challenged myself 10 years ago to run for, for a council, even though I was the youngest of the whole council, with people who were smarter and who were expert more than I, than, than I was. But I think it's paid off because I kind of learned while I was leading. So definitely those are the key five points that I want to share, making sure that we are intentional and that we build skills, network, branding, and that we take our life you know, in charge and we lead. I'm literally applauding you from uh, my little corner in Johannesburg, Dr. Bewa. Thank you so much. Goal setting, skills building, network and mentoring, brand and visibility and dare to lead. Brene Brown coming into our conversation as well. Rumbizai, back to you. What are the things that young women are going to have to focus on? I want to highlight one thing that has been very important for me in my own journey, which is uh, to lead authentically as a woman and as yourself. Uh, I think that remains a challenge uh, for many, many women, especially who are thrown into situations where they are one of a few, to find your voice uh, and to find your space and to find authority uh, and to find the courage to lead 
in a space that's not designed for you to even thrive. Um, and so I, I think it's important that young girls know uh, as they are raised, as they are groomed, and as they emerge as leaders, that they will have to contend for just being themselves. Sure. Lead authentically. What a beautiful way. And especially when masculine, when leadership rather is crafted in such masculine frames and this challenge to, to challenge that frame of leadership by just being yourself and leading authentically. What a beautiful contribution, Ruby Zai. Prof. Patrick, what do our young women need to do? What fight do they need to get ready for? What skills do they have to have in their toolkit? Unmute for me, please, Prof. Thank you. For me, one, for me, one of the most important things is that we really need to think about the global uh, system and we need to nurture our future generations to think about sustainability because, you know, we, we're looking for our own rights at the moment, but there are many other voiceless uh, living organisms in this whole world of ours. And we have felt what it's like to be voiceless and we, we need to nurture our future generations to listen to the voices of the creatures that share our earth because if we don't start thinking about sustainability we're not going to be around very much longer so as women we are caretakers and we're nurturers let us use some of that wonderful capacity as a woman to actually look beyond our own Family sure. and our thank own you so much. Uh, thank you so much, for, uh, Prof. Patrick, for that reminder of sustainability. To Winnie, thank you so much for all the lovely compliments around the conversation. And let's hope that this is a consequential conversation that will make its way into policies, pro processes, as well as uh, in other spaces. Dr. Kambi Kambi, what are young women in the educational space and academic space having to, what do they need to do and be aware of as they take on fights that are going to be emergent in their time? Um, I think uh, what the young women should realize is that um, you need someone to hold your hand. Previously, there was a lot of talk about mentorship. I'm raising that up. You need a sponsor who will hold your hand for the long haul, not just for a reason or for a season like a mentor will do. So find those sponsors. And us, older women, let's sponsor these young ones for the long haul. When they have children who they don't know what to do with because uh, the help hasn't come, let them bring them back to granny. I'll look after them so that they can do what they need to do. And I think I want to sum up to say, to me, the year 2020 is a year of revelation and a year of change because it has shown us how we can do things differently by being at home and working from home. This is our, uh, our forte as women, we work from home. So this to me is going to show how we can move forward and how we can have more women in all the sectors. Dr. Kambi Kambi, beautiful way to wrap us up. Before I call on uh, Professor Kupe, our Vice Chancellor and Principal, just to give us some closing words, I just want to share with you the results of the third poll. Um, and the question and the results here was that um, we think, so I'm seeing the results of the, of the poll, uh, of, of, of the third poll. Uh, which uh, Marius, if we can pull those back up, I'm seeing it says three, but it is actually got the, con the text of two. So there we go. So that's come up, Pro promoting uh, and fulfillment of women's potential through education and skills development at 58%. The Queen Bee Syndrome, what another opportunity for us to have a separate conversation all together to unpack and explore, but sitting at 17% uh, uh, of that. So lots, uh, lots of very interesting results coming through in the poll. And I do believe you can also see them on Slido. With that, ladies and gentlemen, from every corner of the world from which you've joined us, wherever you are, may you please join me in a round of applause for our panelists uh, who have done an incredible job of leaning into the conversation.
bringing their insights, their wisdom, and their experience to these responses. Thank you so much. With that, I'd like to hand over to Professor uh, Tawane Kupe to close us off, please. Thank you so much. If you can kindly unmute for us, Professor, please. Uh, the statement of the year, I was muted, you are muted, unmute yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much, our very able moderator. Thank you again for it. This is the third or fourth time we have you. But our panel, I'd like to thank you for the following. I'm not one of those men who wants to summarize what women say. Women should, men should not speak for women. You spoke for yourselves, the audience res responded fantastically. From my side, I want to thank you for a very te highly textured, layered, complex, and very nuanced debate, which touched everything from everyday culture all the way to the structural issues and what ought to be done. As you had uh, uh, yourselves and your panelists, and as the audience said you, women can do it for themselves. Men need to support, but they need to get out of the way of blocking what women can achieve. So thank you very much. Working together, I think, with these conversations, translating them into practical action, it shall be a short walk to gender equality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Cooper. From all of us, it's goodbye and good evening.